So today I am talking to you about Wilders, uh, which is a genre of popular carnival music from the Twin Island Nation, oops, uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. You may be familiar now with this uh, string of small Eastern Caribbean islands, given the hurricanes that we've had recently, that we have more talk about the U.S. Virgin Islands, small islands like Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, where the majority of my family is, we're actually spared for the, for the most part. So that was um, great. But typically people have no idea where these islands are. And this is where I locate most of my research. Um, I began research on the carnival music scene in these Eastern Caribbean islands in the summer of 2010. And I found in many of my conversations with musicians and non-musicians alike, even with people who would behave as though they really liked the music, the idea that Wilders was too fast kept cropping up as a source of discomfort and contention. Carnival in St. Kitts Nevis is a Christmas time event that has been since the 19th century a loud and lewd, sometimes highly anticipated, widely revered, fiercely guarded celebration of what is at least imagined as African-derived music, recitation, dance practices that developed within the context of a colonial plantation society. As its name suggests, however, the real point or aim of the music is to make people go wild. It's called Wilders or Wailas, as you would say if you had an Eastern Caribbean accent. Uh, there is jumping, shouting, fast, emphatic, sometimes acrobatic dancing, some pushing, and the expectation of nonstop high energy motion throughout the crowd. And this kind of behavior, although not at all representative of even a small majority of carnival celebration activities at large, plays into the genre's reputation as stupid, nonsense, and ultimately as too fast. So I want to offer you an example of what a carnival scene looks like. Uh, most recently, I was in carnival in December of 2016 through January of this year. Um, and I just want you to pay attention to the music that's happening, but also the types of movements that are happening in the crowd around the music. Uh, this was at around 7 a.m. Uh, typically, right after you have Christmas dinner, maybe around 3, uh, hang around with your family, take a nap. By 4 a.m., you should be fully dressed and back outside ready uh, for juve. Um, and then you keep going until you no longer can. Typically around noon, the sun is so incredibly hot and you're so extremely drunk that it's time to go home um, and take a nap. So this at 7 a.m. was really, I was at the end of my rope. Here's an example of what happened. <laughs> agree that the music is very fast? Yes. Okay, if not, my research doesn't matter um, and there's no point for me to go on. Okay, so we can all agree that it's really fast, right? So there is a point to what I'm doing. Um, but uh, the behavior associated with it could be perceived as wild also, but the critique that the music is too fast, not just fast, but too fast, is particularly interesting because as I argue in my larger work, music from St. Kitts and Nevis has been, since at least the early 20th century, characterized by the deployment of a notably faster tempo than other genres of popular music that circulate in and around the Caribbean. Uh, as one musician told me in an interview, nobody was writing songs in St. Kitts and Nevis before the 1970s. We just played covers of other people's stuff. When we were playing in hotels for tourists, we just played it a lot faster to say, quote, okay, this is their song in our style. Um, and so the question for me is not so much about is it fast, but why is it being, being perceived as too fast? Something that's historically grounded um, in accept accepted performance practices where we take songs from elsewhere and make them notably faster, why do we imagine some of these songs as too fast? And I say perceived here because other researchers interested in what makes sound too fast uh, have typically approached music via cognitive science methodologies. 
uh, from the subfield of tempo perception. Music cognition scientists have pinpointed several musical factors that contribute to a piece of music's being identified as fast. For example, ornamentation and melodies, the presence of passing tones, upper and lower neighboring tones, and arpeggiated figures. Uh, so this would be la la la. Uh, la la la, la la la, la 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 la. If a melody has these things, we would hear them as faster than melodies that didn't have these types of movement. Um, also things like in higher octaves or a brighter timbre, so depending on the type of instrument, the mode in which someone is singing, are perceived to unfold more quickly than those played in a lower octave or a duller timbre. Given the general presence of these types of musical attributes in Wilders, which you may have heard in the example that I played, it is understandable that it would be perceived as fast-paced genre of music. But again, my question is about what makes it too fast. And while cognitive studies doesn't offer much by way of culturally contextual analysis of music, it does offer a methodological framework for approaching what it means to move from fast to too fast. Um, on one side, the prevalent generalization in music cognition studies uh, argues that a range of 100 to 140 beats per minute is that of the preferred tempo, with 120 beats per minute being the natural tempo at which humans tend to be most comfortable moving to the beat, and that a range of 80 to 160 beats per minute is the, quote, tempo octave in which every piece of music should be interpretable. Both cognitive scientists and musicians accept that once a piece of music's tempo moves beyond the extreme of metric interpretability, that is, once it gets faster, the human tendency is to perceive the rhythm as unfolding at a slower speed, occurring at a multiple of the actual rate. Right? So if it's so, so fast, you'll just find kind of some subbeats to move your body to in a way that feels comfortable. That is to say, there is a metric range or a set of tempos that may not be considered too fast because they are, for example, perceived as half as fast as a calculated beats per minute would suggest. Indeed, the condition of any piece of music's being too fast lies in a temporal range that is not actually at the extreme ends of the metric continuum from slow to fast. The moment when rhythmic sound becomes too fast is that in which it becomes decidedly uninterpretable to the listen, a moment that does not necessarily correlate with the actual presence of an excessively fast rate of musical presentation. I should note here that some wilder, Wilders hovers around 160 beats per minute, so it is kind of pushing the limits of what our brains are really that interested in anyway. Um, the music in the video we watch is about 165 beats per minute. However, the large majority of it stays within what is understood as the interpretable range and is still somehow understood as too fast. But if we see interpretability as a concept that takes on meaning in relation to those who are using it, and in relation to how those people come to understand and make sense of music and sound, then interpretability functions helpfully as the idea of a threshold between what is accepted and what is not. The question then is what actions, manners of being, moving, or sounding, and which ideas about those actions constitute the milieu in which Wilders and as an extension its audiences become socially uninterpretable and thusly too fast. So like any decent ethnographer, I spent several years asking people, do you think this music is too fast? Okay, cool, why? And the answers my interlocutors provided when elaborating on their discomfort with Wilder's music and Wilder's audiences did point to temporal fastness, facilitated, facilitated by the musical factors I mentioned, even motor coordination. So some feet, folks, like my parents in particular, felt they're too old to effectively dance to the music. My limbs are not moving that quickly, therefore I'm always off beat, this music is too fast. But a larger subset of my interlocutors pointed to more socially oriented creole colloquial justifications for asserting that the music is too fast. So colloquially, being too fast in St. Kitts Nevis refers to two things outside of temporal velocity. A, is someone inappropriately or rudely entering a conversation that they are socially excluded from, namely a precocious child, if 
grown folks are talking about grown folks business and a child decides they would like to enter is fast you're too fast would be said to that child the same thing would be of an adult who is asking you questions that are just inappropriate not that they're um, inappropriate because of the relationship so if I asked you when did you get back on your tax return last year it's just a weird question right that you don't know me why would I be asking you that that person would also be considered too fast in the context of that social relationship the other uh, definition in St. Kitts which is I think more prevalent in all English speaking countries and yeah, let's say English speaking countries for the sake of this argument is about transgressive female sexuality. That a girl or a woman would be too fast, refers to her being particularly promiscuous, uh, lascivious in some way. Um, in the early 20th century, we have slang books, uh, British slang books that talk about women that are too fast are women who gamble and ride horses and smoke cigarettes. So, in that way, thinking about women somehow moving out of the expectations of what femininity uh, looks like. So these definitions and their place in Ketitian Division Creole English are not only etymologically located in the colonial period, the ideas that undergird them too are so strongly soldered to understandings of decorum, proper comportment, and self-aware adherence to mores of colonial respectability as an organizing principle. Uh, when I say colonial respectability here, I'm referring to the social and epistemic aspect of colonization that mandated, among other things, ways of dressing, speaking, and as my project argues, perceiving sound by coding them into everyday interactions. Among these ideas of respectability were understandings of femininity, womanhood, and aesthetics of music and sound and musicianship. All of these ideas about how to be in St. Kitts and Nevis, Nevis mirrored British ideals that were upheld as means of maintaining colonial economic and political arrangements. Respectability in the context of English colonialism with the Anglophone Caribbean was not merely a system of economic exploitation and political domination, but also one of con cultural control that attempted to socialize colonial populations into accepting the moral and cultural superiority of Englishness. In the case of Caribbean colonization more broadly um, and its related enterprises, the transatlantic slave trade and the sugar plantation society, St. Kitts and Nevis, located in Eastern Caribbean, were the, first of for, were the first and two of the most important locations of European continental power since the 15th century. After initial contact between Spanish explorers and Carib Caribbean native peoples in the 1490s, both islands were volleyed back and forth between British and French colonial control for the preceding 200 years. The 1640s saw the introduction of sugar, first in Barbados, then in St. Kitts, followed by Nevis, which precipitated a regional agricultural and economic shift from provision farming on small family plots to large sugar plantations, um, like the, the ruins of the ones that I have pictured here. Through the sugar heyday of the 17th and 18th centuries, St. Kitts and Nevis became permanent possessions of the British and have been referred to as the cornerstone of the almost limitless colonial empire. Between 1675 and 70, 1740, Nevis was the capital port for the Royal African Company, one of Britain's most prominent, prominent slave trading enterprises. And throughout the mid-1700s, St. Kitts was per capita the most prosperous sugar colony. So this is the colonial context. I'm sort of going on about obviously several, like several hundred years of colonization, but to think about what's happening contemporarily, despite the things being post-colonial, is really to have to sort of deal with what several hundred years of history entailed. The physical proximity of the two islands sitting at their closest points just two and a half miles apart facilitated a collapsing of governmental power such that St. Kitts and Nevis, two separate geographical islands, were regarded as one dependent British possession in 1883. This geopolitical arrangement remains intact through the present day even as St. Kitts and Nevis gained independence from Britain in 1983. So in my work, I consider the cultural relevance of 400 plus years of colonization and situate Wilders and the responses to it within a social economy of decorum and colonial respectability. Though rooted in colonization, these turns of phrase and the ways of thinking and being that imbue them with meaning continued well beyond the moment of independence. 
In accounting for the breadth of what the phrase too fast means in St. Kitts Nevis, I argue that my interlocutor's answers articulate the contemporary Kittitian vision relationship to a specific colonial history and colonial legacy that is defined by an understanding of women, sexuality, and musicianship that is reinforced by colloquial language. So taking up the first definition of too fast, I argue in my larger work, uh, excuse me, that where typical use and local use of the word fast expresses disapproval of precocious and otherwise unauthorized behavior. Think here of the scolded child or the nosy acquaintance asking weird questions to you. Criticism of Wilders as too fast similarly is an articulation of discomfort with Wilders artists and the type of musicianship through which Wilders is created. It's largely a digitally produced genre that is most easily recognizable by its use of electric steel pan sound, along with an early 1990s kind of approximation, if you can imagine what digitized sound was in the early 1990s, of a Brazilian cuica drum. Generally, the aesthetic is busy, chock full of tinny, high-pitched sounds that twirl and pop around a singer's melody. Um, and I want to play you another example from 2013. And I just want you to listen to the different high-pitched sounds that they use. I don't know if anyone here would be able to tell me what they are sampling. It is from a relatively new hip-hop song. I don't know if any of you listen to hip-hop. And I want you to listen to the sounds that gather their sonority through really fast repetitions that approach but fall just sort of sounding a sustained pitch. So things that are kind of like ning -ning 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 -ning, that are happening really repetitively close together but aren't actually a sustained pitch. <laughs> understand any of the lyrics? No? no? Anything? Yeah. Shake your bumper. Okay, I might have given you that part, but yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, so we have a sample from Jay-Z from the same year, which is also a critical portion of the music, taking sounds from elsewhere, songs from elsewhere, and sampleize, sampling them and localizing them in a way that makes it that they can't actually sell it, right? So this is popular music that has to exist kind of always already on a black market. Um, they're not selling it anywhere. You can't put it on iTunes. I can't just steal a song from Jay-Z, remake it, and then get 99 cents from it. Um, and that's part of why a lot of uh, particularly governmental officials feel like this is illegitimate music. It is kind of part of a process of stealing. We can say, yes? What, what kind of Latino music are you hearing? Cuban? Cuban? Yeah, kind of, yeah. I mean, so the other project that I'm working on is really to think about how all Caribbean music is part of sort of this archipelagic movement around. Um, but that is another Humanities Day talk. Okay, so given, yes? Yes, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton was from Nevis. If you go to Nevis, they will tell you that a million times. Yeah. And, and, and the show, Cassie Cass paid, you know, I mean, I, it, it made me think of, of music that was used by women. Really? I, of, of course, have not gotten a ticket to see Hamilton, despite being from Nevis <laughs> and a native New Yorker. Um, but yeah, I, that, I, that wouldn't surprise me, actually. So, given how heavily it relies on electronic sounds and samples from other genres of music, the critical presumption is that anyone can make it, and therefore it isn't sensible music. 
socially in St. Kitts and Nevis, as I learned from several interviews with Ketitians and Divisions in their 70s and 80s, who are active musicians in the middle of the 20th century, musicianship is understood as a slow process. There are traditional modes of tutelage, teachers who left and came back to teach is an important part, going to the UK specifically to learn an instrument and then teaching as having that as part of your CV is an integral part. Um, and historically slow moving processes of skill acquisition and even instrument acquisition which Mark Wilder's musicians as engaging in socially unauthorized, too fast, or as I call it, untimely participation. So if you can imagine on St. Kitts and Nevis, these tiny Eastern Caribbean islands, even receiving, when I was talking to musicians in their 80s, receiving an instrument was something that you anticipated for a very long time. Some it would, the act of writing a letter, right, sending for the instrument and just waiting for however many months for it to come. And then it's gonna come and it's gonna go to a governmental office where they're gonna inspect it and there's gonna be taxes on it and somebody's gonna forget to call you and you're gonna go down and the one guy who's in the office is gonna be on lunch. So you're gonna have to come back tomorrow. And all of that they imagine as the process of being a musician, right? These, this is sort of the slow process historically of being a musician uh, in this type of place. A socially accepted narrative of authorized and accepted musicianship often, okay, I just told you the part that I wrote already, but okay, I'm gonna read it anyway. A socially accepted narrative of authorized and accepted musicianship often includes the long wait between saving or gathering funds, writing a letter to send for a new instrument, and the eternity of anticipation for it to travel via ship to the island. Even within traditional or indigenous musicianship narratives, the slow process of finding the right piece of bamboo out of which to whittle a fife, or the meticulousness and trial and error of tuning and tempering a steel pan has attached itself to local conceptions of musicianship as a whole. On the contrary, a Wilder's track can be created exclusively with a laptop and requires a much shorter time before one can consider himself quote, making music. Um, and this, the entire process, so you can get a laptop, um, there is a junior college on the island, Clarence Fitzroy uh, Bryant College, where you can get a degree in computer science. Part of that for a lot of youngsters is that they are now able to very effectively pirate the type of software that they would need to make music inexpensively. Um, once you've made a piece of music, you can finish at 9 p.m. Your friend has a pickup truck with massive speak on, speakers on it. By 11 p.m., you can be blasting the sound you just made today throughout the entire streets. And when you're talking about a fast music process, there's really like very little time between sort of the conception of the sound and it being something that becomes incredibly public. So, and in this way, the genre and the type of musicianship that engenders it is seen as too fast because of its contradictory relationship to the historical tempo of music making on the islands. So the second definition, if we switch gears a little bit, of too fast marks certain female bodies as sexually deviant because of the ways they move. I argue in this project that Ketitians and Divisions critique Wilder's for being too fast because the music engenders and provides a sonic context and a physical space in which to engage in deviations from feminine respectability that even in the post-colonial era continue to be a major source of discomfort and a site of social and historical negotiations. Often critiques of Wilders are couched within discussions of women's bodies, and inversely, the ongoing critique of female sexuality is largely linked to critiques of the music. I should note that when I say discursively, I'm referring to casual conversation, informal and unofficial banter, or intercourse regarding Wilders. And this is also to say that official statements and written texts about the music are very uncritical, not because they are in support of it, but because they neglect to mention it at all. Of the handful of informal published texts regarding music in St. Kitts and Nevis from the last 20 years, none mentions Wilders or really any locally made popular music. Essentially, though it is locally produced, locally recorded, and locally consumed, it does not figure into public understandings of what national music is. Despite general ambivalence toward the role and promotion of the genre, the music itself is inescapable. And like I told you, again, it's on humongous speakers all the time during the carnival period. You cannot ignore it, but we all just pretend like it's not happening. 
Wilder's music is the preeminent sound of Christmas time carnival. During that time of year, historical patterns of circular migration become most evident and the population of 45,000 temporarily almost doubles. The Christmas time carnival season running from late November through the first week of January is a time for reenactment of historical moments, participation in notions of heritage and tradition, and an occasion for heightened religious pomp and spectacle. Essentially, Carnival in St. Kitts Nevis is a time for rehearsing and performing the nation. Due to this condensed emphasis on representation, there is an annually renewed sense of national self-consciousness during Christmas time. The weeks following Carnival give way to plentiful discussions of the state of the Two Island Federation. What people saw and heard during Carnival, especially the things they don't like and complaining and sort of gossip is again another very Caribbean pastime, are accordingly couched in highly nationalist terms. This is particularly true for understandings of nationalism that coincide with ideas of morality and modesty. These ideas, all summarily related to respectability, have been thoroughly discussed within music scholarship as being both inextricable from and antithetical to carnival, especially with regard to the whining or sensual dances the music engenders. Since ideas regarding respectability and the nation almost always circulate via the control of women's bodies, where women can and can't go, what their bodies can and can't do or should or shouldn't do, it is not surprising then that the nationalist post-carnival discussions also center on the behavior of women's bodies. So here are two cartoons from the most popular news and entertainment website in St. Kitts that runs daily. The cartoon on the left from 2013 entitled Parenting Standards Out the Window depicts two relatively scantily dressed women in the latter weeks of their pregnancies interacting in a nightclub setting. One woman proclaims her love for the Wilders band. The other agrees, commenting that she wanted to get her quote, last jam or her last dance session before the arrival of her baby. The idea of course is that she is physically delaying giving birth so that she can dance. Um, or go see a band. Many of the comments about the cartoon agree that this type of behavior, whatever this behavior represents, is a widespread problem and is, and is indicative of skewed priorities and is proof of the questionable parenting that is often blamed for the many social ills, particularly violence, theft, and teen pregnancy that are perceived as plaguing the nation via Wilder's music. The idea of these women's pregnant bodies even occupying the space of the dance is indicative, as one person wrote in the comments, of a lack of, quote, morals, respect, and principles. The second cartoon on the right, uh, which is from this year and really is about a commentary about really every year, points again to patriarchy, the surveillance of women's and girls' bodies, immorality, and Im immodesty as part and parcel of the carnival experience. And I, I don't know if you could read it, but we have a dad, a, presumably a mom and a dad. The mom says, I can't believe you spied on our daughter's entire date. And he says, say what you want, Heather, but it's the carnival season and I'm not going to be raising any babies, right? So the idea that it's carnival just it becomes then a time that, right, pregnancy will happen. Were you, did you, yes. Yes. Mm hmm this is it this is it and this is typically comes out of uh, christmas time sport so in during slavery uh, christmas time would really be the only time of leisure um, and so that really be translated in st kitts and nevis to carnival time because carnival um, from trinidad and as a pre latin thing is not something that's typically indigenous um, they did have celebrations but calling it carnival is really something that happened in the 1940s in trying to take something that was lucrative and exciting from other places um, and bring it to other parts of the Caribbean. Um, this cartoon and attendant discussion center on the issue of black petition and the vision women's bodies and their responsibilities to children, family, and representation, not only the nation of the nation, but also of the race. Um, and they're not without historical precedent. The Anglophone Caribbean has long been a site of anthropological interest, particularly for ethnographic evidence of post-emancipation, New World Black pathology, and the quote, Negro condition. 
Caribbean sexual and familial arrangements were characterized as immoral and unstable in their deviation from European and Euro-American patterns of patrilineal, co-residential, monogamous, and heterosexual relationships. In both cartoons, we see a rehashing of old anxieties about the single and sexualized black woman as an affront to the two-parent heterosexual household that is necessary for the upbringing of responsible citizens. These condemnations of female behavior in relation to Carnival and Wilders are, of course, especially geared toward young, middle-class black women who in other non-carnivalized or carnival spaces are generally seen as upholders of colonial respectability. So, I want to end here by just adding uh, that I'm particularly interested as I'm transforming this project into a book, as is uh, customary here. Uh, and the contrast, I'm interested in the contrast between two of the most prominent figures during Carnival. The beauty pageant contestant as a tenant of natural a national cultural heritage who is the figure of the annual glorification of the skinny, beautiful, talented, well-rounded, well-traveled, well-spoken Ketitia Division woman, um, which has been the case for a very long time. And on the other hand, the vision or the idea, the fear really, as we see in these cartoons, of the promiscuous, wild, black, common woman who partakes heartily in carnival activities and is thusly too fast. All of these conceptions of what it means to be too fast are mutually constitutive. Wilders is known as music made embarrassingly prematurely by unmusicians using uninstruments, and their sounds are heard as the bodily kinetic noise made by sympathetic movements of back th backsides, thighs, breasts, jiggly black flesh, which is often really terrifying, in unashamed displays of mastery, sexual pleasure, and performative bravado. These modes of being fast or too fast are uninterpretable, not because they are the most outlandish, imaginable, or even the fastest behaviors that stand in direct contradiction to col colonial respectability. Instead, they become uninterpretable because they expose the tenuous relationship between colonial ideas and post-colonial possibilities for sounding and being and being through sound. Thank you.